There's like studies after studies that show like abusers thrive in couples counseling and use it to manipulate their partners even more. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. that, that makes complete sense because if couples counseling is is only addressing what's visible yeah. and we don't have the ability to dive into underlying values and underlying issues and, and resentments and, and anything that past trauma, all of that, mm -hmm. then all we're left to deal with is who's essentially better mm -hmm. at manipulating. Welcome to 12 Week Relationships. This is your place for better relationships in weeks, not years. My name is Pi. I'm Dr. Glenn. What's up, Dr. Glenn? So we are continuing along the topic of why traditional couples therapy is bullshit. Yes. Part two. Part two. Have you gotten over the... I feel better. So the, after better? the first one, you know, it, I had some anxiety, but... You were a little bit worried about the last... <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I feel better. So I, I'm in a better place. I mean, it is it is a bold statement to make. And, and what we are saying, again, to clarify, is that yeah. traditional relationship therapy, not not therapy, because therapy in and of itself is, is quite effective on an mm -hmm. individual basis, but mm -hmm. relationship therapy is by and large ineffective in creating long-term positive change that's what we're really talking about not not do you feel better in you know the next few minutes mm -hmm. but long-term positive change 70 to 80 percent of couples after going through this process are still going to end up divorced or just unhappily married yeah so it is by and large ineffective and in the last episode we talked about kind of what makes the field of traditional psychotherapy for couples mm -hmm. ineffective mm -hmm. from the therapist standpoint? Like what is the therapist doing that's making this process kind of ineffective? What are those hurdles? Now we're talking about the hurdles from the client's perspective. So in this part two, this is all client side because we talked in the last one, like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if you haven't caught up with that episode yet, please check that one out because it goes through just seven awesome points from our research. Right. Uh, and now we have seven more. So why don't you tell them first about this research? Uh, so once again, it's based off of 75 peer reviewed scholarly articles. Uh, so re the researcher Stacy, you know, based on like all the things that we were talking about, is traditional couples counseling effective? And if not, what are some of the barriers that were involved? So the first part, the first um, one we covered was basically the therapist uh, barriers that are involved in treatment therapist characteristics and then the next one that we're doing now is client barriers and why it's not working in traditional couples counseling let's do it and and just to, as an overview the reason that we land this number and we, we said 70 to 80 percent conservatively so conservatively <laughs> traditional couples therapy is 70 to 80 percent ineffective in creating lasting long-term change these are the reasons on the client side and these are the list of hurdles that have to be overcome for the people to actually find you know use out of it and in my opinion the number of people that make through these hurdles is actually substantially less than 20 to 30 percent i would say it's five percent maybe that's another research study in the future yeah that, that's an anecdotal number so please don't like <laughs> please don't quote me on this you got it all right so number one so client barriers and couples treatment number one Treatment does not address low level affection, specifically attachment issues, right? So when you go to couples therapy, your upbringing, how you were raised, right? Your relationship histories, right? All of that plays into what you're doing in your current relationships now, right? That's interesting. What is low level affection? That basically, the term means attachment issues. Okay. So like with attachment in terms of how you were raised, how you grew up in your home, and then mm -hmm. from there, how that translated into your your relationships previous to the marriage or that the relationship that you're in right now. Yeah. And and for those that are unfamiliar with attachment theory, this is, you know, whether a person's more likely to kind of feel anxious, like always wanting kind mm -hmm. of validation in the relationship, mm -hmm. or whether they're more distanced, right. whether they feel secure, whether they right. feel it's kind of the the way that we engage in in a close interpersonal relationship right yeah so for example like if you had a very controlling parent who was like everything is on my terms mm -hmm. that attachment that you're going to learn is you're going to be love is based on doing things for other people sacrificing my independence so then when they grow up and they start to get intimate with other uh, partners they're going to be really needy they're going to constantly feel like they're not loved they're going to mm -hmm. need a lot of validation right so those low-level attachments growing up 
dictates a lot of the relationships you do in the future. Yeah. 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 That's, that's very fascinating that that is not addressed within the therapy model. And, and to be honest, I have seen and heard it many times mm-hmm. where the counselor will actually say like, you know, well, the past of the past and those are Mm -hmm. issues for you to kind of figure out or you know this is your chance to change this this is Mm -hmm. you know we don't want to be thinking in you know what you've been through this is your opportunity to now uh just think ahead right and it's kind of like well there has to be this balance of both right Mm -hmm. because on the one hand the way that you grew up and it's it's relevant from the standpoint of you and the way that you would interact with the other person. Mm-hmm. And it's also relevant from the under person in understanding how you approach everything. Like somebody, to give examples of this, let's talk about the anxious attachment, right? Mm-hmm. This is that example that you just gave. Yes. So what were the parents like in this situation? Very controlling. They're, you know, the kids are there to serve them. Mm-hmm. Or it could be like the cheerleader mom, like I couldn't become a cheerleader, so you're gonna live my dream and you're gonna become a cheerleader. Yeah, and so that model, and, and it generally starts with parents because this is the first close relationship we have. Mm-hmm. So, so when it ends up happening with the person is that mm-hmm. they're constantly in this state of validation. What they do yeah. is to get mom and dad to say i love you to say Mm -hmm. that i'm proud of you to make them happy to gain their support Mm -hmm. and you take that into your friendships and you become the people pleaser the Mm -hmm. one that wants to make everyone's you know lives better that rarely Mm -hmm. thinks of myself that and then you take it into your romances and you continue yes the crazy part is that the anxious person is going to unconsciously be attracted to kind of narcissistic people people that are willing to right like yeah you're you're basically drawn to your opposite not opposite but your compliment yeah the person that's uh, is willing to to allow you to be yes, needy yes the, yeah. the person that wants yes to you to because if i'm narcissistic mm-hmm. and i know that you need constant validation yes even subconsciously right then you're going to be always doing nice things and kind things for me right. and i'm very rarely going to be thinking of you and exactly. the fact that i'm not yeah makes every now and then when I do say, oh, thank you so much for this, it makes mm-hmm. it that much more like a like a drug right. because I never get validation from him. So exactly. the fact that I'm getting it now is amazing. And you keep doing what you're doing and I'm mm-hmm. obviously benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. So you fall into these weird patterns of relationships. Yeah, I mean, this, that's, this is where individual accountability and ownership comes into play, right? So that example of that person grew up in that type of home And they have two choices. One person that's treating them with respect and really healthy. Mm -hmm. Another person, like you said, is a narcissist or a person that's just very emotionally cut off. And then so then they get to be the needy person that that they feel. They're going to choose that person that's not treating them well. Correct. Yeah. It it feels natural. It It, feels natural and it complements their pain at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what we'll do another episode on. Yeah. Um, cliches that i hate but the mm-hmm. idea of opposites attract is is complete garbage it's the law of compliments yes it, it, it's the compliments it's the idea that what, what people think in this is that yeah. you're being attracted to you know oh they're completely different from me and that's why no mm-hmm. the reality is that person's like your parents you're attracted because they're similar to your parents in the way mm-hmm. that they were so if you are it, it, to, to put it another way you're raised by narcissists Mm -hmm. who essentially put their needs and their wants and everything above your own. Mm -hmm. And so you get into this forced state of like validation Mm -hmm. and you carry it forward. So when you meet the narcissist, when you Mm -hmm. meet that person, it feels good because it's familiar. It's familiar. And it also comes from desperation Yeah, because you never had that need met in your life. Um, so it feels like, you know, if you didn't eat for a week and you give someone a cookie, it's yeah. going to be the best cookie that they ever tasted in their life because it, it brings this euphoria because I'm trying to get something that I didn't ever have. So for that not to be addressed for the past, you know, kind of experiences that have led to this place to mm-hmm. not be addressed is nuts. It's nuts. It has to be addressed. And that's why I like a relationship pattern. And what we do in CVFT is we look at your attachment how you grew up we look at your relationship chain yeah previous to this relationship that you're you're seeking couples counseling in what do your relationships look like and what are the stages that you are in 
so we can have a clear picture of what you're bringing to the table yeah and and the goal being to get everybody to that kind of more secure attachment to get them to this place where they're neither anxious nor are they avoidant nor are they they're, they're in this healthy state correct correct and then they're able to use that to heal and then to start living their value-driven life and become the best version of themselves i know it's generic but to be mm -hmm. their best self yeah yeah interesting okay uh so number two couples treatment does not implement trauma work that is required in therapy and this was a huge one most people view therapy like there's normal couples issues right mm -hmm. and then it's kind of a stereotype like everyone just there's like really bad issues and then there's normal couple issues mm -hmm. but the truth is most people are suffering from some form of trauma yeah and it comes out in your relationships and it needs to be addressed absolutely that was a big one for me uh, that was to me the missing piece of your model trauma triggered therapy was mm -hmm. addressing past trauma and that's what made okay taking this core value roadmap and then mm -hmm. putting in trauma triggered therapy that's what gave us core value focused therapy right. um, but it's such a, a key piece because to to relate this in in like story context right I have seen multiple cases where somebody will let's let's give a basic example something that's like relatable right um in in one example a husband is asked you know i'm trying to i'm, I'm trying to think of the facts of this so i don't like give away any important details of the individuals in this but basically the the husband is asked like let's go do it at an activity right mm -hmm. and this guy we're going to call him john um, John responds back to Sarah. Mm -hmm. Fictitious names, guys. Don't don't go look up John and Sarah. You're gonna spend. Well, do please go look it up. You'll spend five thousand hours on the Google machine. Okay, so John says to Sarah, "Let's go for a run." And then Sarah says back to John, "You think I'm fat, don't you?" This sounds funny, but this has happened almost played out to a T, mm -hmm. no less than ten times yeah. that I've seen. And in this case, traditional therapy would tell John that he's communicating incorrectly. They would say that, John, when you ask to go for a run, mm -hmm. you need to say, Sarah, honey, this has nothing to do with anything like health or your size or your shape or anything like that. I just want to know, would you like to go on a right. run for 45 minutes with right. me to spend some time together right that is frustrating is stupid yeah and then it's enabling you're enmeshing an issue that's clearly that other person's issue because they feel insecure about their weight correct right and then now you're enmeshing and forcing the other partner to partake in this it's ridiculous and it almost makes the like the way that i would say it just to address that mm -hmm. brings the whole issue back to the surface again Mm -hmm. Because I have to say, this isn't about right. the way you feel about your weight or right. your body. And just mm -hmm. in saying that, I'm also like making it, I'm bringing it back into every single conversation. Right. But you're pigeonholing a deeper issue into this symptom management, let's stay in this framework approach. Correct. Which is ridiculous. So the, the reality is that Sarah in this situation has underlying trauma. Correct. That is her responsibility to resolve. Exactly. And it, it's, it's tr she was triggered by that statement because you're right. She has issues to resolve. It'd be one thing if, you know, that person were to say, you are fat, get off your ass. Yes, that would be go. completely that, different. Then, then she's triggered because that, that's a very hurtful thing to say. But yeah, but just in that example, she needs to take ownership and say, yeah, this is my issue. I got to work it out. Yeah. So when we sat down and, and you went over trauma triggered therapy and what mm -hmm. it was, and you said, these are the places that when you feel triggered by something, that's your place to work mm -hmm. and you shouldn't be trying to control the environment that for me was yeah like a light bulb moment it because nobody else mm -hmm. teaches that way at least none of the other people that i'd seen none of the yeah. books that i'd read yeah so that to me was a huge piece that in a functioning therapy model the individual on each side has to be held accountable for their mm -hmm. individual responsibilities mm -hmm. and the relationship must be held accountable yeah. for where those areas intersect the joint responsibilities 
but yeah. your issue shouldn't be put on someone else. Agreed. And then, you know, versus like, you know, you're, you're acting out of control or you feel emotions that's beyond being rational instead of, oh, you're being crazy or being irrational. Your pain's coming out. This is a great opportunity for you to heal it and to work through it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Let me trauma pull. needs to be addressed. Trauma needs to be. And then this was a, the second point on that is usually like, even if it's not said, it's so like in a couple session, if one person is very vocal about the issues, you know, that are taking place in, in the couple's problems and one is really withdrawn, that is a red, that's like a red flag that there is trauma in that, that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Right. So as a, as a therapist or a coach, once you're seeing like one person being very vocal and one being withdrawn, there's trauma issue there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, number three. Treatment is often gender specific, right? So um, same sex couples that come in for, you know, coaching or counseling or traditional counseling in general, it's based off of a heterosexual model, mm -hmm. right? So like, you know, oftentimes like- I don't even know what that means. So like as a man, like if a man and woman come in, like a, a, a typical approach is like the man wants to feel important and wants to be respected in the dynamic. On the flip side, the woman wants to feel like she's the most important person in the world Got and it. through that dynamic creates intimacy, right? That is kind of like a very heterosexual, you know, man, woman type approach. Heterosexual and also like heteronormative. It's yeah. like you're, you're yeah. defining a very specific, not just gender role, but right. then how they behave within those roles. Correct. Or what if the gender roles are reversed, right? And they yeah. don't fit the stereotype, right? Yeah. So same sex couples in terms of treatment, it's not effective. It's too gender specific, mm -hmm. right? Versus like, you know, like CVFT, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It just matters what your values are. It, your values, your attachment issues, your trauma triggers, the support, the work through, it's not gender specific at all. It, it even goes beyond that to say like the, my, the thesis for the roadmap was that this applies to all relationships. Yes. And we have an episode on that. Like mm -hmm. what if, what if I said, what if we said that every relationship follows the exact same framework? Mm -hmm. Friendship, family, yes. marriage, business yes. partnership, all of this Correct. is the same thing. Correct. Driven by a set of core values. Now mm -hmm. it's not, not attached to gender roles, nor is it attached to, you know, any what is considered like normative behavior or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's mm -hmm. it's completely independent of it. But I, I would think that that limitation on traditional counseling, and mm -hmm. not only I would think this, but I've, I've seen this, that it, it not only limits it from the standpoint of like, you know, LGBTQ couples, but also from the standpoint of what if the relationship dynamic is completely different? Mm -hmm. Because how do you, you know, for a woman who is a high power lawyer mm -hmm. and for the guy who maybe works part time and stays home, mm -hmm. How do you help them to understand what's going on and what is needed to increase their fulfillment and satisfaction when you're stuck in these ideas of, oh, well, you need to give room for him mm -hmm. to be able to step up and be the man of the house. Correct. Which is completely ridiculous at that point. It's it's insanity. Right. But you know what's crazy? Like this is like like going behind the curtain and some of like, you know, therapist, you know, with other therapists is they would take this model of like the whole heterosexual model and they'll be like, okay, so assign that to the man and assign that to the woman. Yeah. Which is like ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Dude, I, I've read in books. Um, one of them was Steve Harvey's book. That was a, a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Harvey, his book has sold millions of copies and I have nothing against Steve Harvey by any means. I, I think mm -hmm. it's an entertaining book. I think he's an entertaining person. Mm -hmm. But this book was filled with so much misogynistic heteronormative behavior mm -hmm. guised in the idea of psychology yeah that i wanted to throw up what made me what made me like stop and realize hey this book is still valuable is because the baseline of this book was saying things like you know respect yourself that was about it respect yourself mm -hmm. oh he said don't give out the coochie too soon he literally says mm -hmm. that in the book don't give the don't give the cookie too quickly that was his and i'm like you know yeah, yeah what's interesting about that book and the fact that it sold millions shows me that there are I, I can't name the number millions of people in this world hundreds of millions of people in this world mm -hmm. that haven't even received that basic 
motherly, fatherly guidance of like, respect yourself. Yeah. Don't give up the cookie. Because that's really what it was. But outside yeah. of that, yeah. he's actually telling women in this book yeah. that to get a man to love you, you need to give up your stuff and support his dreams. Mm. To to get um, you know a relationship to work, mm -hmm. you got to make him the hero. Yeah. Every man needs to feel like yeah. And then you get those kind of common, you know, it almost sounds classically old school and traditional, this mm -hmm. idea of a, a woman is supposed to act incompetent just so that yeah. the guy can feel like he's our hero and knight in shiny armor. No, I get it. I, I remember like, this was like 15 years ago. So I went to like a, a friend's wedding. It was a traditional like Korean wedding. So it was like their Christian family. But the wife, she's like a, you know, neurosurgeon rich she makes all the money the husband stays home he doesn't do he doesn't work like he just stays home and raises the kids and he doesn't really raise the kids because the grandmother takes care of the kids mm -hmm. right and then so then during the ceremony because you know they go to a traditional church and then the the pastor was like you know i, I won't say her name but she was like you need to honor your man and do whatever he says and she, he was reading the bible quote and you could hear the gasp people are like oh like that's crazy like she's doing all the work she's working she's providing the home um you know and then this guy's just chilling like he looked like 10 years younger than her because he's just like he's just doing his thing you know but the whole point was like the, he, there was even like religious wise like she still had to honor the man yeah when it should be the opposite in that in in, in that dynamic that brings me to a point that's probably for another episode but the you know these highly religious orthodox religions that that teach this type of behavior mm. i can't imagine how many relationships they've destroyed in doing so yeah in trying to force people or just how many people they've made unhappy how many people they've made kill themselves yeah. how many people they've made miserably stay in something that is affecting their emotional and physical well-being yeah no. but that's what happens i agree i agree um number four as a couples, as couples progress, the treatment models need to match and accommodate the changes. So a couple sub points, like most often you get surface level treatment and they'll keep going back to that same level of treatment versus like this couple is going through a process with you. And so as the process starts to grow, you need to keep using different frameworks and models to match their growth. So once again, you have to be able to use multiple models to match the growth process in a couples therapy session. Well, this goes back to in the previous episode, most therapists don't even use a framework. Yeah, and the ones that do only stick to one. And then it comes down to their opinion. Yes. Yeah, which is really, really scary. So, you know, I think, you know, once again, this whole CVFT model, we use multiple modalities. Yeah. And we use it throughout because we're promoting this growth process. Yeah, I mean, CVFT, core value focused therapy is essentially an amalgam of every therapy model put into a way that's simplified mm -hmm. and given a roadmap. So you actually have places to go. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm a person that's, I'm not smart enough to like go in and reinvent the wheel on all this stuff. I, I feel like Freud and, and every psychologist and researcher that have come since mm -hmm. then uh, is far smarter than I am. The only thing I feel like I was able to do better than most is to say, this is what's practical, this is what's not. And this is what the entire picture looks like by piecing together in a way that's simple enough to follow and understand mm -hmm. for anyone. And then your side of that to, to bring in the, the actual therapy model, to bring in the model of you know addressing trauma. Now we have a, a modality, a model that encompasses basically the best of everything we know thus mm -hmm. far. Yeah. Is it perfect? No. There's yeah. going to be tons of new things that we're going to learn, but we actually have a workable model that can be used repeatedly. Yeah. And then people can see their progress. Correct. Yeah. And then there's actually like homework assignments and sheets that they do. They can see what's happening and right in front of them. Yeah. And the same homework assignments, the same sheets, the, the same, same sheets. Yeah. That to me is so critical. Like how is it? Yeah. How can people be certified as therapists and all be doing different things? No, I, that's I, wild. I, I agree. I agree. I, I don't know how to respond to that other than I agree. I'm, I'm trying to think of any yeah. other business or any other model that's like that. I mean, if you are a certified accountant, if you're a CPA, you don't get to go to the IRS and be like, hey, you know what? I decided to do this one different from what you said. Yeah. 
you follow an existing set of practices. If you're doing mm-hmm. financial statements, you follow an existing set of practices. In any industry, when you mm-hmm. are certified, you follow a set of practices. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think just in general, like, you know, traditional counseling is going through an evolution too. So instead of this medical model, there's a more, ho- a more holistic model out there yeah. because we're just not these, not everybody is the same, right? And emotions, well being, all of this, it requires more than what's being offered right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's uh, next? Next one. Number five. Some partners are not mentally and emotionally able to partake in collaborative communication and it forces greater depression and problems in the relationship. So, I like this one. So, a couple of things. The therapist needs to know when to not proceed with couples therapy. Like one person just may not be ready to do so. Yeah. And so they need to they need to be able to say, hey, this is this can't happen. You need some more individual counseling. Let's hold off on this. That's point number one. Point number two. If you have a therapist that is good at what they do and they're using multiple frameworks, they're going through the, you know, they have a a framework of understanding of what's taking place. They can use this opportunity to help them work through, have the other partner be a support system through this process and then, you know, hold space, you know, proper boundary setting, holding space, model the behaviors. So it comes down to two things. So one, if they're just not ready, they need to refer them to individual counseling. Second point if they have a modality in place, they can demonstrate and help provide the partner how to support your partner and how to be accountable for what you do all within that space and time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the other fascinating thing about that. The traditional therapy is generally going to force two people to sit down and suddenly become effective communicators. Yeah. When in reality, you know, a lot of people... It doesn't matter whether they're good or not at it. I mean, number mm-hmm. one, how do you objectively be a good communicator? How do you objectively be good at resolving conflict? I mean, mm-hmm. you've got people that spend, a professional is going to spend decades and thousands of hours to become objectively good at communicating mm-hmm. or objectively good at resolving conflict. Yeah. So the best of us going into a relationship are still garbage compared to a professional. The other thing about that is that how many people it's just not in their nature to want to talk about this stuff and that's okay but the fact that traditional therapy forces you into this role of like you got to be a good communicator and you mm-hmm. got to be able to do these things there's a brilliant book uh anthony can you find the author the book is called um it's called how to fix your marriage without talking about it mm. and it was precisely based on that idea that in many cases putting two people and sitting them down in a room and forcing them to talk about it is exactly what's going to destroy the relationship. Yeah. And then, you know, communication, verbal communication is like 10% of communication. 90% yeah. is your body language, Yeah, the actions that you do. So there's other ways of communicating besides commun- besides talking. For sure. And it, it forces, again, the idea that if you believe that that is correct, right? If you're a couple, mm-hmm. And you believe that this is the only way to a successful relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only are you under a false impression, but you're going to think that something's always wrong because the other person doesn't sit down to discuss their emotions in depth, Mm -hmm. like the way that you might want to. Sure. And that's not the case. That's not a, that's not an actual problem Mm -hmm. uh, in, in many of these situations. Well, I mean, the other thing too, is like you can have a person that's a good communicator, but they're very emotionally stunted. Like they're, they're able to share thoughts and opinions about things, but they're so emotionally withdrawn inside versus the other person. They have difficulty sharing because they're so connected to their feelings. They have a hard time mm-hmm. processing it all. So yeah. like communication, I mean, it is important, but it's not everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number six, couples counseling can often promote and enable toxic behavior. So what this allows is because there's it's surface level treatment, you know, it allows emotionally abusive partners to thrive and diminish healthier partners. This is what I experienced, isn't it? Yeah. From yeah. that. I, I don't want to go back through it. It made you that was when we landed at our first awkward transition moment. I re- I remember we that. Like, I don't I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah. That went deep. So if you guys want to hear that part, go back to the last episode. But it, you know, it talks about like, you know, abusers. Like abusers thrive in this environment. Right, because everything is superficial, it's about symptom management, and they're able to stay within that space and be like really glorious within that space. The other person's withdrawn and scared because they're afraid of what's gonna happen. They're more into their feelings. They're actually the healthier person. 
So then the toxic person can thrive. And there's like studies after studies that show like abusers thrive in couples counseling and use it to manipulate their partners even more. Yeah, because I mean, yeah. that, that makes complete sense because if couples counseling is is only addressing what's visible yeah. and we don't have the ability to dive into underlying values and underlying issues and, and resentments and, and anything that past trauma, all of that, mm -hmm. then all we're left to deal with is who's essentially better mm -hmm. at manipulating. Yeah, and who can get the therapist to take their side Exactly. And, you know, pick their opinions and, sh and side with them. So the narcissist, the person that is, you know, a, a fantastic manipulator is yes. going to excel in this situation because they yeah. know other people's emotions and how to get those emotions to come out. They'll play the, mm -hmm. this is, I'm, I'm going to stop here because this is bringing up some <laughs> feelings, it's bringing up feelings. Just watch the, the previous episode. <laughs> yeah. You'll see what I mean. Yeah. Um, number seven. Uh, and this is kind of repetitive, but depending upon the severity of the couple's issues, treatment can lead to divorce or separation. That one's an interesting one. What does that mean? So, I mean, like if you, you know, like in the previous one, like if you're on the verge of divorce and you go to a therapist that doesn't know what they're doing. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You could be on the verge of divorce. So depending on the, the severity of your marital issues, that could lead you to breaking up or yeah. divorcing. Yeah. yeah. I could see that very much being the case yeah so it goes both ways a therapist the therapist can lead you to divorce but then if they're not good that's a barrier that can also lead you to divorce as well as the client as a couple yeah yeah what are some of the other client side hurdles that there might be because i don't know that we can find data on this but mm -hmm. i would be very curious to see like how many couples actually go to therapy not with the intention to resolve anything, but mm -hmm. rather with the intention to be validated for their decision to leave. I think that's a big one. I think a lot of times, like when you get to the point where you're thinking about divorcing or separating, that that's the agenda. Like I'm going to prove my point right. Is there any way to like actually find a number on that? We can try. We can try to look it up. I I'm so curious about that because... yeah. I found that, you know, when I was going through the case studies and I had people that I was meeting with, mm -hmm. uh, it was a large number of them. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't have enough yeah. of a sample set of people that I had counseled to, to mm -hmm. know. I think there was only 10 couples yeah. before I met you. There was 500 case studies that were observational, but there was mm -hmm. only 10 couples that I had counseled. Yeah. But a, a good number, I want to say about half of them, it was not about actual repairing anything mm -hmm. it was do you approve of my decision to leave mm -hmm. but not said clearly like that and and even if it were it was i actually called one of them out for it i said mm -hmm. you know it it doesn't sound like you're working on fixing anything it sounds like you're just looking for me to validate mm -hmm. what you know your your decision and and i and i said you know i'm not able to validate like i can tell you what's going on i can tell you but this ultimately comes down to your decision. Like this is your decision and I can say this is what the relationship was and this is most likely where it's going to go and you got to decide for yourself if if it's right for you. But it, it kind of surprised me how many people were going just to say, essentially just to walk away saying, mm -hmm. I tried everything. I mean, you know, I can only speak from personal experience, but couples that I've seen, um, where they're like going through the divorce process or like it's very serious that they're going to do it. That is their agenda when they come in. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and then other times like, you know, for individuals that come in and they're trying to work things out and then they'll bring their partner in later, they've already seen a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I'll hear that a lot. Like, you know, my advice is the lawyer, you go see someone showing that you tried, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I think, you know, I, I feel like that's probably accurate. I have a question. Have, have there been, been any instances where the therapist actually d concludes that their the best option is just a divorce? Absolutely. And you know, there's like the conscious uncoupling, right? Like, you know, it doesn't staying together doesn't mean success. Like if it's better that you guys are to, you know, you've grown apart and then you can successfully heal from the marriage, learn the lessons that you needed to learn so that you can have healthier relationships moving forward, that in and of itself would be a success. Is that something that they're actually allowed to just outright suggest? I'm curious about that too, because that should be a potential thought, an idea that mm -hmm. can be laid out. Yeah. 
but I've never seen it actually laid out. And in, in each instance, in each case, regardless, even in my own case where I'm 14 yeah. years deep and they know that and they know how many people and what I've tried, mm -hmm. not a single person who was an actual therapist said, like, you know, this is not going to get better. Well, I mean, ethically, ethically, I don't think you can say like, I think you guys should divorce Correct. because, you know, Correct. that's, that's an opinion. Um, but you can like through the process. I, I mean, I think it's ethical to say, Hey, we've gone through this process and it seems like it's not getting better. And it looks like you have options that are available to you and it'd be important to discuss those options. That's what I thought would have been pertinent, mm -hmm. but it never happened. Nobody ever said, yeah. based on what you've done and what I know, mm -hmm. it's not likely that your marriage is going to change. Mm -hmm. It's just going to continue being the same, which means you need to decide whether you want this or not. Mm -hmm. Nobody was ever willing to say anything like that. Well, I think the other thing too is if you're going through you know, a successful process, you're going through such an emotional journey that even without saying it, they know, right? Like if it's if it's superficial and you're just kind of getting like superficial treatment and you're kind of going through it, then yeah, like, you know, then okay. But with, if, with our model, they would know. With our model, the two people on the other side could see what's in front of them. They can know the work that's in front of them and say, correct. I want to do this or not. Correct. But with everything else that I've seen in traditional counseling, Agreed. there is Agreed. no place where that realization Agreed. is available. But even, even in the, you know, they, they said the good friend treatment model, if you're a good friend and you help them process enough, that should be on the table. Like you don't say it directly, but look, this, we've taken this, look how far we've gone. At least explore this, you know, you, you need to have explore all your options. I think uh, traditional therapy qualifies success by whether the couple stays together, huh? Instead well, of it's true. Well, yeah. ideally, yeah. I mean, because you have to measure, they want to measure outcomes, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think shifting the focus from whether the couple stays together to what you guys are doing, which is individual happiness and um, security, I think yeah. it's a much better qualifier for success. Yeah, it's redefining what success is. Yeah. And, and the know? relationship being successful is just a byproduct of that. Um, yeah. Success should be defined by whether it's this relationship or the next one. Mm -hmm. You are living a healthy happy mm -hmm. functioning life and 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 whatever it is partnership with the person that you're closest Absolutely. to but it shouldn't be success shouldn't be dictated on this current relationship succeeding or not agreed but i but i i, I agree with you that currently it is all predicated on the current relationship which is difficult because in in many instances people you know like myself are already in a really bad relationship before mm -hmm. they ever really come to know any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so to base success of, you know, agreed, it, it doesn't seem like an appropriate metric for sure. No, I agree. But Wait. go ahead. No, that that's, I just, I agree. Yeah. Coming from where we're at, I think our, our measurement of success in terms of CVFT is more so, um, presenting what a healthy relationship looks like helping you to have the tools to resolve past trauma to address current issues and to get yourself to a place where you can decide whether this is right for me and i'm gonna work mm -hmm. through this mm -hmm. we're gonna work through this together mm -hmm. or we're gonna consciously uncouple mm -hmm. and we're gonna take that knowledge into our next relationship that to me is success Agreed. Like regardless, yeah, agreed. There's multiple forms of success versus just staying together. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the other hurdles client side, because I, I just wanted to bring these up because you had seven points client side, mm -hmm. but I would think there are also other hurdles that are maybe a little bit more difficult to measure uh, and, and research. Mm -hmm. One of those would also be stigma, the negative stigma attached to counseling. Like how many times does one or yeah. both people enter counseling with the idea that this isn't going to work? No, agree. I mean, I think stigma just in mental health in general. Uh, but then, you know, I think there was like other articles that were in there that was researched that gender specific, like males are less likely to seek out treatment because it makes them feel weak hmm. in general. Right. And then, yeah, just a negative view. Some people have a negative experience in, in couples therapy, so they have no desire to try it again. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I think and one, one of the biggest points, though, is enmeshment. Once couples come in, their individual issues are all enmeshed together with couples issues. Mm -hmm. 
and it becomes this stormy mess and then everything just becomes a surface level approach while underneath there's all this drama and craziness that's taking place it comes out in moments and then it goes on for years and years and years and nothing is really resolved I, I i think that makes a lot of sense especially when therapists don't have a singular model to kind of operate from to say like this is what's going on this is where yeah. this is where the individual accountability uh, accountability lies mm -hmm. and this is where the relationship accountability lies when there is no framework for that mm -hmm. you I, can't because how would a therapist without taking sides say this is your responsibility this is your responsibility no agreed and then if you have no framework you're just basing it on your own experiences and opinions yeah and they're just going to perceive it that way they're going to yeah. perceive it as you're taking sides now agreed and because they essentially are yeah yeah interesting yeah yeah, that enmeshment issue is a is a big one because without a working model that can go that, that can do these things, then you have no way of untangling mm -hmm. everything that gets mixed in with each other. And, and so you just end up with let's talk about the way you're fighting. Let's talk about the way you're communicating. Let's talk about. Well, besides that, then the couples therapy promotes emotional suppression. So who can suppress their emotions better? is perceived as a healthier person and then based on what we talked about then the therapist will side with the person that's easier to deal with yeah yeah fascinating so okay anything else client side from why traditional couples therapy is ineffective in creating long-term positive change do we got anything else that's all I can. once again symptom focused it's symptom focused mm -hmm. and it promotes long-term treatment versus taking care of things in a shorter period of time yeah and addressing underlying core issues. issues yeah love it love it love it love it the research for these past two episodes i have to thank stacy and and you thank for you, setting this whole thing up thank you yeah stacy's research was amazing she spent probably like 80 100 hours on this like it was a At good least. amount of time yeah like a month and a half almost a month and a half yeah putting it all together so yeah she she did a really great job that's wild yeah well, awesome guys i hope you all enjoyed this episode uh those listening and watching well we'd love for you to subscribe to the channel obviously you can find us anywhere where podcasts are available on itunes on spotify um i believe iHeartRadio, and that is coming soon and other platforms we're also on youtube uh and in the meantime if you'd like to learn more about core value focused therapy we now have 12-week coaching packages available for couples uh, on 12weekrelationships.com and you can book a free 15-minute consult with Dr. Glenn. He's going to walk you guys through exactly what the process will do for you and you guys can make the decision and begin a journey that's going to lead you somewhere very positive. Uh, and that's it for us, right? Yeah, that's it. Thank cool. you so much. See you guys next time. Thank you.